you may just find that you need a custom PCB to breed life into that old 8-bit system of yours. Well, if that's the case, look no further than the sponsors of this episode, PCB Way, to make your PCB designs a reality. And with PCB fabrication starting for as little as $5 for 5 boards, and a free $5 coupon for every new customer, you can sample their services for as little as the cost of postage. And why not check out their shared projects section? You can order a tried and tested board that suits your needs exactly and have it sent to you direct. Because that's the PCB way. And we thank them for their support. How you doing everybody? Greetings and welcome back to the basement for a second look at this Philips VG5000 Micro. Now you may remember in the last episode where I was looking at this system, we had a really good look at the outside of the system. We popped it open, we had a good look on the inside of the system, see what made it up, and we managed to get it powered up. We wrote a Hello World program, managed to save it to cassette, and to load it back, so we kind of thoroughly tested the system that way. It seems to be working okay. Now, the system when I bought it came with a couple of accessories. It came with a joystick interface, and it also came with the original power supply, but that turned out to be kind of faulty. It wasn't working right after all these years. So I had intended to look at games and stuff in the first episode, but I didn't get the chance to because the time I had put aside for making all that got eaten up by making another power supply. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to have a more thorough look at the games that were available for this. Now this system came out in 1984 and it was exclusively here in France that it came out. And actually when it came out, it was jostling for a place in the French educational system. It wanted to be kind of the new or the French BBC Micro more or less. So the other two systems were, were fighting for that place with it were the Alice 4K and the Thompson M05. Now in the end of it, it was the Thompson M05 that won out and this and the Alice kind of faded into obscurity. So what that means is there was never very much developed for this system. So really cassette is the only way that we can load software onto this. There was never any disk drive conceived of for it and there was never any cartridges or anything like that made for it. So any files that we want to put onto this have to be in WAV or mp3 format or some kind of sound format that we can play. Now I had a little look on the internet and on the internet archive I found a file containing all of the games that were ever written for this system. Now there were only ever about 40 written for it and some of them were educational titles which aren't of much interest to us. They were kind of for French kids learning how to speak English. So the ones that were left over are your regular kind of Space Invaders and Pac-Man type affairs. So we're going to have a little look at some of those games. But what I noticed when I extracted that zip file was that all of the, all of the ROM files were in K7 format. Now this is a format I came across before when I was dealing with my Alice 4K. And it seems to be kind of an exclusive French kind of format for French systems. And I looked into it because it interested me. And when I found out why they were called K7 files, I felt like a complete idiot. And I'll tell you why. You see, I've been living here in France for the last 16 years. And it should have been obvious to me, but it just wasn't. It just went right over my head. But K7, when pronounced as a French person would pronounce it, is actually cassette. So they're cassette files. I mean, I should have known it, but it's just stupid. But anyway, these K7 are cassette files work great with emulators. You can just plug them into an emulator and you can play whatever game they are. They load up great. But with the original hardware, they don't. So you need some kind of program to convert them over to WAV files. And that program is available for the Philips VG5000 micro cassette files in the form of the DC toolbox. So that's a little program I downloaded. And all you have to do is put the cassette file you want into that little program and click convert and it'll create a WAV file for you. Stick it onto your mobile phone or whatever device, plug it into your VG5000 micros cassette port and you can load up all those games and work away fine for you. So that is what we're going to be looking at today. We're also going to look at little joystick expansion as well and we'll see how this computer fared with other computers of its time. But before we get into all that, I want to give a big shout out to a guy named John. Now, 
John has a channel that I've been following for a while. It's called the Retro Repair Guy. And uh, I've learned a lot from this channel. That's why I want to kind of want to, to shout it out so that you go and have a look at it because it's, it's good. Now, being the Retro Repair Guy, he repairs retro stuff. And he's done some 8-bit computers. He's done the Commodore 64 and he's done some work on the Commodore VIC-20 as well. But it's not just that that he does. He also repairs the likes of VCRs and also amplifiers, old quadraphonic amplifiers and stuff like that. And he also has some tongue-in-cheek videos as well out there, like how retro technology can save your marriage and how retro technology can help you in a zombie holocaust. You know, things like that. It's fun. It's fun stuff. And yeah, it's good content. Go check him out. But anyway, let's get back to this little video now and we'll play ourselves some games, eh? All right, so it's time for the main event. What we're going to do is we're going to load up a couple of games on the Philips VG5000 Micro and see what they look like. And the very first game that I've chosen to take a look at is a game that's a classic on any 8-bit system. So we can kind of compare it to other systems, see what we got going here. So Load Runner is the game I've loaded up, but it's kind of unfair in a way for this system because this version is written in basic, so it makes it very slow. You'll see in a moment when I run it just how slow it actually is. But here we are. The game has now started up and we can't play it yet because it's actually drawn the first screen. So this takes a little while to happen. But what you can see is the game, if you don't know it, what we're doing is we're a little white guy down here at the bottom. We have to avoid this purple guy here and we use ladders to climb up and climb down and collect these little yellow treasure chests that are scattered around. The fight the five keys that we're using to move around are our left and right and up and down. And then we use the space bar to dig holes to try and trap the enemies in. Now, as you can see, this game is slow. It's very slow. And the reason for it is it's written in basic. So there's a lot going on. And the fact that it's written in basic makes it very slow. But as you can see, it also makes it very easy. So there's really no challenge in it as such. That guy there is a guy I'm supposed to be avoiding. He's just standing there. He doesn't come after me or anything. This guy here, he moves very, very rarely. So I can go around and I can pick up all these treasure chests without anything to hinder me, really. So it's, it's unfortunate because the game looks nice. And had it been written in machine language, for example, it probably would have been a great game. The other thing about it is joystick support isn't integrated at all in it. So we're kind of have to use the keyboard and the cursor key layout isn't all that intuitive. Left and right are left and right, but the up and down key can have to, well, I have to search for them to see where they are sometimes. But that is pretty much that game on this system. And like I say, it's not very fair. It's been written in basic, so it's got a handicap straight away. So what we'll do is we we'll load up a game that was written in machine language that uses the joystick adapter and we'll see if that works a little better. We'll see what the system has to offer that way. But before we do that, what we'll do is we'll have a look at the joystick adapter itself and see what's inside in that little box. Okay, so we're after trying a game or two on the old Philips VG5000 Micro. And fun and all as it is, I think it would be even more fun if we used this VG5200 joystick interface. For example, straight away, we've got two joystick ports on it, which means that this guy is offering us two-player gaming off the bat. Now, if we turn it around, you can see normally it's held together with two screws that look just like these, but I've removed them already to speed up this process somewhat. So, looking at the PCB that's inside of it, straight away you see these two largest components, which are two DB9 connectors, and they look exactly like a Commodore 64 DB9 connector would look. However, they're wired up a little different, but they are compatible with Atari joysticks, funnily enough. Now, each of them is connected to a resistor pack, and each resistor pack contains six 3.3 kilo ohm resistors. The other passive components on this board are these three capacitors here, and each of these capacitors is associated with a logic chip. So we've got one 74LS32N, which is a quad two input OR gate, and then the other two chips here a 74LS365ANs, which are hex tree state buffers or bus drivers. And finally, we've got this connector here to connect it into the back of the VG5000 micro. So in essence, what this board is, is a board that will allow an Atari joystick 
to talk to the VG5000 Micro. And I'm hoping that this little guy here is going to provide the magic that is arcade gaming for me. So let's throw it all back together and see what it can do. Yeah, that's right, this VG5000 Micro has a version, a clone version of Pac-Man available on it. And it's this one here, it's called Le Ton, in, well, in the French version of it anyway. And it is a machine language game that uses the joystick, so I said we'd have a little look at that. So what it's telling us here is to press 1 for a one-player game using the keyboard. We're not going to do that. What we're going to do is we're going to press 3 for a one-player game using this Atari joystick that I've connected up to it. So we'll press three and it gives me a whole menu, a kind of a list of different options I can pick here. So I can pick the level I want to play. Or this guy here is actually this kind of funny level where the, the walls of the maze disappear. So it, you kind of have to remember where the walls are and stuff while you're playing it. Uh, also P here lets us design our own levels, which is kind of handy. You'll notice that these guys down this side of the screen are flashing. If I had a second joystick connected, these would become available and that way we could play a two-player game. But it's not like two people playing at the same time, it's take your turn but with different joysticks. So what we'll do is we will select level zero here and I'll show you that. So I'm this guy here in the middle who's just after getting et by one of those ghosts. But you see that there aren't dots all over the screen like there are in Pac-Man. In this version here, um, there are only 12 dots. But there are those little power up, the colored power up ones that let us eat the ghosts. And the other thing is that the dots move around the screen. So it's not just go around collecting the, the little pellets. What you got to do is you got to try and avoid the ghosts. But at the same time, you're forced, forced to move to try and get the dots as well. You know, so you can't really hide all that much and then plan your strategy as such. So it's like Pac-Man, but it's got a few subtle little changes. And uh, it makes the game kind of playable. Actually, it's not a bad game at all. And we're using the joystick instead of keyboard, which is good as well. The fair button doesn't actually do anything. Um, but there you go. That's pretty much this game. The further on you get, the harder it gets. The ghosts go a little bit faster and whatnot, as do the pellets going around the screen. So this, is, this isn't a bad little game for this system. You can see kind of graphically, it looks fairly good as well. It's a quite playable game. So what we'll do is we'll have a look and see what the Space Invaders clone on this system looks like. See this red spider guy here? He's Le Monstre de l'Espace, or the Space Monster. In this VG5000 micro version of Space Invaders, which is a heavily modified version of Space Invaders. Ignore the screen flashing and flickering there, that just kind of happens with this game. But this guy takes the place of the UFO that flies across the top of the screen in Space Invaders. And this here is our spaceship more or less, or our army tank in this version of the game. What we're going to do is we're going to press 3 to start on level 1 using the little joystick here. I'll be able to show you better how this game plays. So, you see, it looks a little bit like Space Invaders. However, there are a few differences. Down here at the bottom, these are shields to protect the aliens, and we can't actually destroy those. We have to shoot beyond them to shoot the aliens. These three um, kind of barriers down here can't actually be shot through. So what we're doing is we are trying to shoot the aliens. We're also trying to shoot that space monster there up the top. There we go. Now, what you'll notice is every time the system plays music, every time, the processor is kind of taken up doing that and the game stalls, which is a pity because it kind of breaks the gameplay every single time. So here we are, we're after destroying the space monster, we're after getting a certain score for that, and what we're doing is we're trying to destroy all the aliens to finish the level. But you see, every time there's, there's music played, the game stops. Now, this is another major difference in this version between this and Space Invaders. When you get killed, you turn into this little man. So it's kind of, he's after escaping from his army tank that got shot upon. Now, if I get hit by a missile when I'm the little man, it's game over for me. That's it finished. What I need to do is go to one of these barriers here, which is actually a tank, and press fire. So these barriers are kind of like our ships or our lives, really, in a way. And what we're doing is we're just killing the aliens to try and get a high score. But like I say, it's a version of Space Invaders, but it's not all that great. The thing that really kills it, the thing that really kills it on this system, 
it's game over for me. The thing that really kills it on this system is every time music is played, that's it, your processor kind of stops and does just that. So the playability of the game is kind of cut in two every single time that happens. But uh, yeah, that's this game here. I can put in my name, I'll put in 8 bits with my super high score of 260. So there we go. So we'll move on, we'll have a look at one more game and see how that plays. Now, so I'm just after loading up a game of football for the Philips VG5000 Micro. So, to start it, what we do is we press space. Well, we don't yet because it's making noise. You remember, I can't do anything else while it's making noise. But we press space, and what we have are three options here. We can play a one-player game with the keyboard, or a one-player game with the joystick. Two-player game is also available here, but you're, you're using joysticks exclusively for that. So what we'll do is we'll press two, so that we can play a one-player game with the joystick and it's asking me to name my team so i'm going to call it eight bits that's my team s there we go and i press enter so the game starts players file out onto the screen there's a little cheer a little whistle for the teams and then they do a little victory dance now in this game here i'm going to be playing the red side and you see the player that i'm controlling is going to be yellow that's the way he'll show up and I can switch between players by pressing uh, fire to take control of whatever player is nearest the ball more or less so what I'm doing is I'm running after the ball here and trying to ah, I got it there now so I need to run down to the other end of the pitch now what you see is everything is smooth and nice until the camera starts kind of scrolling the pitch as such and then things kind of flicker a bit which is all right too, I suppose, forgivable in a way, but I'm sure that could have been avoided had it had been programmed a little differently. But um, what I need to do here is try and score a goal. So there we go. Did I get a goal or did I not? No, I didn't. I must have been to the side of the goal or something. So here we go. Up again. We'll try once more. No, I think I'm to the side of the goal. I know. Look, I got a goal. Woohoo. We're winning. But um, one of the problems that I have with this game, you'll notice up here that the timer is shown. 43 minutes and 41 seconds. Now it's sped up a little bit. You notice the seconds clock down fast enough. But you still need to count like 20 minutes aside for each game. So if you're playing either one player or two player game, you're looking at kind of an hour to see who's won the game, which seems awfully long to me. It'd be nice if there were a way to reduce it down to five minutes aside or something, which maybe there is, but I, I haven't discovered it. But um, I, think it's, I think it's nice. It shows that the computer, well it should be, I mean, it's got the Z80 processor, is well capable of controlling kind of some form of AI for a number of different sprites on the screen and have them moving around and doing different things and whatnot. So um, yeah, this is, this is a game, I'll be honest, that I like this one and it's surprising to me because I'm, I'm not a big fan of sports games. But that is that. So what do I think of this system? How does it compare to other systems I have or other systems that came out? In 1984 the time that it came out and what we'll do is we'll go to the outro and I'll tell you all about it okay so we're after more or less getting to the end of this episode so what do I think of the Philips VG5000 micro having looked at the hardware in the first episode we had here on it and now having had a look at some of the games that were available for it well to be honest with you I see it as a kind of a double-sided coin as far as hardware went, it's a fantastic system for the time. It was very, very powerful. I mean, it had a Zilog Z80 processor in it, which is the same as what the ZX Spectrum had in it. So it was quite capable at that level. One thing that it had that Spectrum never had was a dedicated graphics chip in the form of the Thomson EF9345. And that little chip was more than capable of doing what we saw here, but software kind of let it down. Now, the other thing is out of the box, this came with only 24K of RAM. It had 16K for the system and 8K for graphics. So it was a little bit anemic memory-wise, but there was a 32 kilobyte expansion available for it. No, 16 kilobyte expansion, in fact. So it was, hardware-wise, it was more than capable. But I think what let it down, the reason that it's not remembered at all, is that Philips wanted their part of the pie in the French education market. So they slipped this in nice and quickly good, strong, solid hardware to compete with the likes of Thomson MO5 and the Matra Hachette Alice 4K. But they didn't put too much thought or effort into the software they had. And you'll see that in two of the games that I showed today. 
the Space Invaders clone and the Pac-Man clone are direct conversions from the Philips C-52. Now the Philips C-52 was Philips' clone of the Odyssey 2, technology that was like created back in 1978, released in 1979. So they were running like really old software on new hardware. I think that's the reason that this thing fell flat on its face. Just to better illustrate nice and quick, this here is the video pack, the Philips C52 that came out in 1979. And watch what game I'm playing on it. This here is Space Monster, the same game as we were playing on the VG5000. Granted, the graphics aren't as nice, but the gameplay is much better. It's more fluid, it's faster, it's playing sounds, and everything isn't stopping to just let the processor do that. So, as you can see, if this system that came out in 1979 could play a game like this, where was the interest in buying a Philips VG5000 that was running pretty much exactly the same software? People saw the Philips VG5000 and what it could do. They saw what the Thompson MO5 could do and they automatically ran straight for the Thompson. That's pretty much it. That's the reason why this guy faded into obscurity and is now really only remembered through YouTube videos pretty much like this. So that is that for the Philips VG5000 Micro and these two episodes. But what I will do is I will leave you with a Star Trek joke for today. So Captain Picard, he was on the bridge and he ripped his shirt and he said, oh no, I'm after ripping my shirt. And Beverly Crusher turned to him and said, that's okay, I have a sewing machine I can lend you, Jean-Luc. So that evening, Jean-Luc is in his quarters, he's trying to sew his shirt, but he can't get it to work. And he ends up breaking the sewing machine. So he's panicking wild because he likes Beverly and he figures she's not going to like me now that I broke her sewing machine. So he calls Lieutenant Commander Data who comes in and he says, ah, I've analyzed the sewing machine, Captain, and I have files in my positronic brain that can help me fix it. Picard turns to him and says, Mr. Data, make it so. You see? And then he fixed the machine because it's a pun on what he said. There you go. That's the joke for today. If you haven't done so already, click the subscribe button down the corner, even though I know the jokes are bad. You know. And uh, yeah, what you do, take care, and we will talk to you in the next episode. And for any of you who are wondering, E.T. is still around. I just had to move him because there was a lot of cables and stuff and you get caught up in him. And he's still there, you see? He's all right. He can't talk to E.T. He can play video games. But yeah, anyway, talk to you in the next episode. See ya. Bye bye.